Jacqueline Smith's career on screen has spanned over 20 years, making her one of the most beloved and enduring actresses working today. Not content to rest on her laurels, Jacqueline has also become a high-profile businesswoman after launching her own line of clothing. Jacqueline's biggest joy in life, however, is her family, and she's a devoted mother to her two children. Like all working moms, she's made trade-offs along the way to achieve that delicate and often hectic balance between career and motherhood. Jacqueline has accomplished this with a grace and style that's made her famous. We'll take an intimate look at this dynamic and talented lady as we profile her struggles and triumphs, revealing the secrets of the woman who really does have it all. I'm John Forsythe. Please join us for an intimate portrait of Jacqueline Smith. Jacqueline Ellen Smith was born and raised in Houston, Texas, in a traditional southern home. The Smith family lived on a quiet street in a middle-class neighborhood. I had probably what you call an ideal upbringing. I had uh, incredible parents, and I grew up in Houston, Texas, and even though that's a major city, it, it had a very provincial feel to it. It had sort of a small town feel to it because there were neighborhoods, and there, there was riding your bike, there was walking to school and walking home, and, and a freedom that uh, certainly my kids don't have today. I just remember an uncomplicated life. Well, they were just a loving family, and they did the most they could for Jacqueline and her brother. The house was always decorated, beautiful. It was just a typical American home. Her father, Jack, was the local dentist. Her mother, Margaret, was a homemaker. They were devoted to raising Jacqueline and her brother, Tommy, with integrity and old-fashioned values. My mother's a total Southern belle. You know, she's just <laughs> uh, this very feminine, uh, you know, that she would never have dreamed of, you know, making her, I mean, working. I mean, it, she worked within the home. I mean, frankly, I think that's the hardest role you can take on in life to do it right and to do it with your whole heart. Jacqueline was a precocious and sensitive child and Mrs. Smith knew early on she had a performer in the family. She said I could always tell what kind of day you had from the way you came out of school. If I was unhappy I cried. It didn't matter who saw me. You know I'd oh you know I'd come out crying. Well when things went wrong if she ma made a bad grade in school she came out crying. I say, aren't you embarrassed to be crying? No. no. She didn't care. It's hard. As a young girl, Jacqueline formed a close bond with her grandfather. A Methodist minister with a serene love of life, he had a special place in his heart for his young granddaughter. He would go to little towns across Texas and preach in these little white wooden frame churches that were incredible, you know, so simple and so beautiful. So I had the joy of watching him. Um, but I think really more than listening to a sermon, it was just his life that was the example. You know, it wasn't anything judgmental about him. His love, which I say is, you know, a major uh, bonus in life is it wasn't conditional on my behavior. You know, he was just there to simply adore me. They were just kindred souls, sort of. And uh, she just loved him. He loved her. And they were cute together. They had fun together. Jacqueline was lucky enough to have her grandfather in her life while she was growing up. And his death, when she was 18, was a major blow. 
and he lived to be almost 102. 102. Yeah. As Jacqueline grew up, her beauty couldn't help but attract attention. Luckily, the down-to-earth values in the Smith family home kept her from becoming too focused on her looks. Oh, she was beautiful, but you, you'd never know she was beautiful because she never thought she was. I don't think she's ever thought of herself as being pretty. Well, I mean, no, I, she knows she's kind of ugly, but you know what I mean? I don't think she really thinks she's beautiful or anything. I think like the rest of us, all she sees are her flaws. <laughs> I think on some days she gets up and puts it together and she says, hmm, I'm looking good. But on most of the days, most, most women, I don't care how attractive the world thinks they are, tend to look in the mirror and see all the things they'd like to do differently. Beauty was never um, talked about much growing up because it was always about what you are inside wasn't about the physical appearance. You know, pretty is as pretty does, one of those old Southern sayings. By the time she finished high school, Jacqueline had her heart set on pursuing a career in ballet and dreamed one day of opening her own dance studio. I think I took it to her first dance class or two. From then on, she loved it. In fact, she danced through the house instead of walking from then on. She loved it. Well, I always loved ballet from a little girl. I mean, three years old, I was, you know, but I think it was into the tutu and the pink slippers. I had a natural ability for dance. I mean, I had a turnout and an extension, and a, uh, it was just, I was a natural for it. Soon her enthusiasm and ambition outgrew the opportunities in Houston, and she begged her parents to allow her to move to New York City to pursue her career as a ballerina. Daddy, he'd bring home articles and say, well, somebody was mugged on the street and some people watched. I said, Daddy, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. But, you know, he, I was his little girl. He didn't want me to go. After a year of college, Jacqueline couldn't wait any longer and finally she convinced her parents to let her go. Suddenly, Jacqueline Ellen Smith, who had never left the state of Texas, found herself alone in the Big Apple living at the Barbizon Hotel for women. The Barbizon Hotel, girls. <laughs> That's the only way we would let her go, if she stayed there, and uh, which sounds weird now, but it, it was a pretty strict place. And of course, the boys were not allowed. <laughs> I think they could go to the mezzanine and meet them. I mean, uh, they had very definite rules for these girls. So we felt pretty safe they're going up there. It was 1969, and thousands of young hopefuls crowded the New York dance and theater scene. Jacqueline's years of dedication and practice paid off and immediately set her apart from the crowd. She had only been in the city a couple of months when she got her first break. Really, my first job was in Central Park. I, was, I had gotten a job as a dancer dancing in this sort of show, and in fact, William Shatner was him seeing it and everything and, and uh, I danced and then we were rehearsing there and um, Harry Abrams my first commercial agent saw me and said you know you ought to do commercials the agent was right Jacqueline was a natural in front of the camera and her focus turned from dancing to acting there's something I want to tell you about shampoo it might make no difference to you but it does to me every leading shampoo is mostly detergent except one Gold formula Breck. Breck has far less detergent, far more natural ingredients. Breck gets out the dirt, but leaves the natural shine. I don't know about you, but I feel better just knowing about gold formula Breck. I was very excited. I had a very hard time catching her on TV because her first commercial was the Listerine. And it didn't show that often, but we were told it'd be on this channel, certain channel, and we'd sit and wait for it. Then we'd leave, and, it, and somebody said, oh, I saw a commercial. Not surprisingly, it wasn't long before Hollywood came knocking. I um, first had the pleasure 
of meeting Jackie Smith when I was doing a television series called Switch. When he comes around, we'll tell him he's lost a small fortune at the tables. If he buys that, we've got him. How soon do you want him off his feet? At the rate he's winning, you better make it fast. In five minutes, he won't be able to count the thumbs on one hand. That's my girl. I remember very vividly about this because um, we were on the news. We were on the 5 o'clock news in Las Vegas shooting this thing. I got back to the hotel and uh, <clears throat> the telephone rang. It was Dean Martin, and he said, uh, hey, uh, Pally. He said, my God, what a great-looking girl. I said, yeah, she is pretty, isn't she? And I, I knew exactly what was going on. So I, I uh, went back to Jackie the next day, and I said, uh, I got a call yesterday uh, after I got back to the hotel. She said, from Dean Martin. <laughs> Dean Martin? I, I don't remember. I mean, I, you know, it's vague. It's vague. Dean Martin wasn't the only one to notice her. Little did she know, the young girl from Texas was about to become a household name. Stay tuned for more Intimate Portrait with Jacqueline Smith. Intimate Portrait is sponsored by Chrysler. We're reinventing the passion for driving. Welcome back to an intimate portrait with Jacqueline Smith. I'm John Forsythe. Two scotch and water, two vodka tonics, one Bloody Mary. And one apple juice. Jacqueline's performance as Allie on Switch impressed star Robert Wagner, who was about to produce a new primetime show with Aaron Spelling and Leonard Goldberg. Smith's life and the face of television would change forever. In the creation of Charlie's Angels, I, I had to do with uh, recommending the writers that were the ones that originated it. And uh, my late wife and I, Natalie Wood, uh, had a commitment, uh, three commitments with ABC, and uh, Leonard Goldberg called me, and he said, we have a terrific idea for a show. And uh, I read the script, I thought it was terrible. He said, I think that this show will be the biggest hit that you could ever imagine. He said, I think that these girls are going to wind up on the cover of Time Magazine. I said, Leonard, I think you're absolutely crazy, but if you want to go ahead with it, yeah, we'll, we'll go in with you. I think really the, the original concept of Charlie's Angels was a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead, and I wasn't a redhead. And so I went in and read and didn't give a particularly great reading. And, you know, hey, it was just another interview. And RJ said, this is the girl for you. You know, forget the redhead. You know, you got to go with her. And I think that's really, I think he really sold them on me. Well, she was perfect for that character. She was absolutely perfect for that character. I, don't, I can't think of anybody else that could have done it, you know. Charlie's Angels premiered on September 22nd, 1976, and was an instant hit. The premise of the show was simple. Three beautiful women who solved crimes always caught the bad guys and through a mean karate kick. In many ways, it was unlike anything that had ever been on television before. An action adventure show starring women. And as predicted, the three angels appeared on the cover of Time magazine. I thought it was um, an interesting concept because rarely do you see three girls as a lead in a, in a show. Um, and here, and, and, and it had a, it was to be a con, and it had a flair, and it had style, and, and, the, and the concept was unique in that you never saw this man, and there was mystery to it. That mysterious boss, Charlie, was played by yours truly. And while I never actually appeared on screen, each week I had the pleasure of giving my angels their new assignment. Hey, hello. Good afternoon, Bosley. How's the weather in Hawaii, Charlie? Perfect. We're having a snorkeling. Better all get on a plane and come here. I've been kidnapped. Co-starring with Kate Jackson and Farrah Fawcett Majors, Jacqueline played the role of Kelly Garrett, the sensitive angel with a sweet demeanor. Her calm and serious manner always helped the angels catch the criminals. Cheryl Ladd joined up during the second season after Farrah left the show. We had a couple of possibles. We're running out of time, so we better split up. You take the car, I'll grab a cab. Check this one out, and I'll see you back at the hotel, okay? Got it. 
At the beginning of Charlie's Angels, it must be what, you know, the rock stars experience today. You couldn't walk down the street, we were shooting, we were with guards, and we had to be taken through kitchens and alleyways, and, and, and you know, this whole intrigue just to get to our motor home or to our home. We were just, all of us, just shaking, just trembling, terrified of it. And that's when it hit us all that, oh man, this is scary. This is, there's more to this than we anticipated. Charlie's Angels was the number one show in the country. With over 36 million viewers, the Angels quickly became America's sweethearts. I don't know what made Charlie's Angels a hit. I, I can tell you that it was the most gigantic hit uh, with the merchandising and with these three girls. And uh, I don't know whether it was the chemistry or the the time but they caught lightning in a bottle i think people forget now how big a hit i mean it was the equivalent in a strange way of er those first uh, especially that first year it just exploded that uh i don't think there were many guys in america who didn't watch that that show when it was in its prime just couldn't wait to watch her see her <laughs> her daddy couldn't either he got mad somebody said oh hey his friends say, you wouldn't look at that if your daughter wasn't in it. He'd get furious. <laughs> she was a very easy girl to work with. She had great style. I didn't have to show a great style. <laughs> she had it. It was easy. That's all I have to say. I loved working with her. She's the only woman I ever really wanted to slap. And they said, why, why would you say that? And I said, because, you know, at 5.30 in the morning, you go in there after having worked a 15-hour day the day before. You go into makeup and hair, and Jacqueline walks in with damp hair, not a stitch of makeup on, and she absolutely is breathtaking. And you just want to slap her! <laughs> the pressure and schedule of any weekly series is grueling. Often the Angel's workday lasted over 15 hours. But Jacqueline was always meticulous about taking care of herself. Certainly all through Charlie's Angels, she was one of the most disciplined people I ever met. She didn't smoke, she didn't drink, she didn't, she got her rest. I mean, that beauty uh, that she had didn't come from, you know, being out partying all night long. While the show grew in popularity, behind the scenes there was trouble. Jacqueline had married actor Dennis Cole, but the relationship was falling apart. It was a very difficult time for a woman as traditional as Jacqueline. It's really an interesting phenomena about the show that all three of us lost marriages during the show, which is very strange. And so for all of us, really we had the best of times and the worst of times. We had all this fame and all this attention, and yet our personal lives were disastrous and painful. So we would have to come to work and be these sort of grown-up Girl Scout people who had it really together and were doing the right thing and looking after each other and we would go home at night to, you know, troubled times and pain and, and relationships lost. The end of several of the cast members' marriages wasn't the only thing to make the headlines. The show itself was stirring up controversy all over America. Many women's groups were denouncing the show, saying it exploited women. They talked about Charlie's Angels being sexually exploited. We really weren't. We were these independent women who always set out and accomplished our feet, so to speak. I mean, we, we, we always got the bad guy. Uh, so I frankly think they should have applauded that it was three girls uh, as leads in a show and uh, not concentrated so much that every now and then we were in a bikini. We really weren't. We were really you know, in a bikini at the beach. I never felt exploited. I felt it was mild. Before Charlie's Angels, the roles for women on television were wives, nurses, secretaries. I mean, very limited views of what a woman does and what a woman is and how a woman is portrayed. And in a really strange way, I think it gave little girls the idea that they could be powerful, that they could get the bad guy. And when you look at what the shows are now, uh, from Baywatch on, the, in, the inherent, obvious, 
sexuality of the show. Well, you look at Charlie's Angels, it was like, hello, milk and cookies? <laughs> you guys want cookies? Okay, great. <laughs> you okay, Kelly? You okay, Bree? I mean, that was our dialogue. Please. It was so tame. Charlie's Angels as a, uh, a step forward for the National Organization of Women? Nah. It was, an, it was a simpler, earlier time. You know, we weren't quite as consumed with political correctness. But at the same, in all seriousness, if you really look at the show, you were dealing with a show where the males were either disembodied voices or almost uh, comic uh, figures, and the women were actually doing all the work. Even a hit series must come to an end. And in 1981, Charlie's Angels went off the air. Jacqueline has the distinction of being the only angel to appear in every episode over the five-year run of the series. I'm happy I stayed the five years. And there was no... Uh, I wouldn't have considered breaking the contract. Again, that's where Southern Upbringing comes in. You don't break the contract. You just go and do it. And I fulfilled the five years, and I'm happy I did. She had a thousand things she's, she could have done. Uh, you know, I mean, she could have left the show as well. You know, she could have gone on her way and done whatever she wanted to. I really admire her. I think she'd mind me saying that. Hear how Deidre Hall survived the daytime soap and risked her real life for her one true dream. It was the sixth time that she had tried the in vitro, and they couldn't bring her out of the anesthesia. Up front and outspoken, Lifetime's intimate portrait, Deidre Hall. Tomorrow night at 7, only on Lifetime. You're watching Lifetime, television for women. Solar magnetic energy is expected to interfere with radio, television, and satellite... Welcome back to Intimate Portrait with Jacqueline Smith. Even while enjoying her status as one of America's biggest TV stars, Jacqueline was finding it a challenge to be taken seriously as a dramatic actress. Tony Tremopoulos uh, was doing a show when he was head of ABC, and he uh, they were doing Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. And uh, I proceeded that I wanted very much to get this show. Everybody said, no, she's Charlie's Angels, she's QB, she's uh, uh, no actress, no quality, it's uh, just a pretty face. Well, we were looking to do the uh, Jackie Kennedy, JFK story. And uh, when we were looking to who could play Jacqueline Kennedy, this is now in 1981, um, they came and we talked about uh, Jackie Smith. And there were some people who didn't feel that she had the capacity to play the role. Well, they certainly didn't want me for Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. They did not want a Charlie's Angels. And they said, absolutely not. I mean, this girl is, I mean, they're going to see uh, a Barbie doll up there for Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. We can't have this. And uh, so they said, well, at least meet with her. And I went to Tony. And Tony said, gee, a good idea. And uh, he asked uh, to test her. And I said, no. Uh, he said, well, can we have a, you know, just maybe a reading? I said, no. As you've got seven years of Charlie's Angels. That's enough. You've got enough film on it. Uh, but we, Jacqueline agreed to do a voice test. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, they said, the role is yours. Well, I think the moment she went into wardrobe and you looked at her, you knew that, that, that she was uh, Jackie Kennedy. I mean, she personified what we all believe of that Camelot period of time of history. Oh, gosh, when I was told I had the role, first of all, I was ecstatic, but I was also very nervous because she is part of our history. She is so familiar. And how can you do justice? At the hospital, they tried to keep me from him, but I, I said, I'm not leaving. It's my husband. His blood is all over me. Why did I wash the blood off? I should have left it there. You let them see what they've done. The TV movie, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, was a tremendous hit. And Jacqueline received a prestigious Golden Globe nomination. No agent's a genius, okay? I can say that in front. Uh, you get lucky, and the artist really is the performer. But when Jacqueline was really, had read the material, you saw the change in Jacqueline, from the pretty girl realizing this was a great opportunity for her to take the next step. And she knew that. And that was really the change that we all knew, that Jacqueline was growing up. It was an exciting and heady time. The young actress had recently married cinematographer Tony Richmond. 
and the two were hoping to start a family. In the film, Jackie Kennedy is pregnant, and for Smith, it was a chance to dream about becoming a mother herself. I wore all these pregnant pads, you know, she was pregnant, I was pregnant throughout Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, and I just remember thinking, oh, I wish this were me, oh, I, I, you know, if I could just... So finally I wasn't feeling well and I went into my doctor and, um, and she called me back and she said, you know what, the test is positive. And sure enough, I was pregnant and um, it was just the best, it was... the best, you know, day of my life, that of all the people maybe at that time of my life that I, young women that I met, I thought Jacqueline would be a wonderful mother and should be a mother, because her kids were going to get a lot of love and a lot of patience and they were going to be listened to and cared about, you know? Jacqueline's very public pregnancy caused quite a stir, and she celebrated her pregnancy with her fans. Overnight, she became America's icon of motherhood. Son Gaston, named after Jacqueline's grandfather, was born March 19, 1982. Three years later, daughter Spencer Margaret joined the family. For Jacqueline, motherhood would prove to be her most rewarding role ever. All of a sudden, in a flash of a second, they're in your arms. And from the moment they're, they're there, you know. There isn't anything you wouldn't do for them. Not, not a thing. And, and um, I mean, that's the way I feel. It's really hard to articulate the kind of love, magic, fulfillment they make. As often happens in life, joy was mixed with heartache when Jacqueline and her husband Tony parted ways after eight years together. It's heartbreaking when, when a family breaks up, but you know, you have to, you know, be strong about it and, and realize that, uh, you know, you're just going to do everything to make it okay for the children. That's the sad thing. I think when I, I think one thing Tony and I did right is have the children. That we made no mistakes about. And that was the most positive part of our relationship because out came these two unique, wonderful children. And I'll always be grateful to him for that. Those who know Jacqueline know that, you know, that uh, the, the public perception of a faultless, flawless life is hardly true. I mean, that, that she has had her share of hard knocks. Life is usually three steps forward and two steps back. But she perseveres and she has gone through, you know, bad spells and never let anybody else know about it. Even when she was going through a very painful separation, she never weighed that burden on anybody else. You know, what makes our particular situation difficult is that we parent in a different way. And I think the children sort of see that and understand it. Um, but again, they have to deal with it. And that, that's heartbreaking that they have to deal with it. I mean, believe me, I've shed many tears over it because you want to give them the most positive start that you can. Jacqueline's career was booming with starring roles in huge miniseries like Robert Ludlum's The Bourne Identity and Sidney Sheldon's Rage of Angels. But as her children grew older, it was becoming more difficult to take them on location. Now a single mother, Jacqueline would have to make the difficult choice of which came first, being an actress or being a full-time mom. I think Jacqueline could have done more professionally uh, if it wasn't she had to go to a PTA meeting or she had to go to Gaston's ball game uh, or hockey game or get up early in the morning to drive Gaston to go surfing and instead of saying, well, I can't go because the kids are going to be out of school and we've planned a vacation. But I said, well, I have this particular script. I think it's a good move. No, Jack, I can't do that. And I know not to argue with her about that. And I do have respect for it. Motherhood is the, uh, the number one thing in Jacqueline's life. And I think uh, motherhood is probably the toughest profession that any woman can have. She's a wonderful mother. The life I've chosen is certainly not always easy. And um, 
you know, I'm a working mother, and, and there's guilt that goes into that. But I'm fortunate because I can pick and choose what I do now because being a part of my children's life is the most important. I don't want to work around the clock. I don't want to take one movie after another because I would miss too much, and I know I would, I know I would regret it. I just wanted to tell you that you're my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I